Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to season two of the Encore Offstage podcast. Unfortunately, I'm starting off on a bit of a somber note, and this episode is dedicated to a very good friend of mine. Sadly passed, his name was Vic Roberts. Vic, I met when I first started getting involved in amateur dramatics many, many, many years ago in the early 2000s. And we remained strong friends ever since. We performed on stage together. He was usually my dad in many things. We did plays together. We did musicals together. Not many musicals. He wasn't that musical. Um, But he was a character. He was a really, really good soul. Um, He loved performing. He won Actor of the Year twice, I believe. And Vic, mate, I hope you're up there right now doing that play that you always wanted to do with those greats that you were always talking about. Laurence Olivier, um, James Dean, all of them. I hope they're there with you, mate, and you're having a damn good chat with them. So please, please, everybody, I'd want to dedicate this episode in particular to the memory of Vic Roberts, and I hope that his family receive my very deep condolences. So along, Victor, and thanks for all the memories, dude. And welcome to the Uncle Offstage podcast. It's a conversational podcast. We chat about all things theatre. I'm Ben Bradley. I'm Lucy Gazard. And I'm Adam Guest. Hello, everybody. Uh, hello, guys. How are we doing, everybody? Good to be back for season it's two. It's great, yeah. We had a nice festive break. Do we all have good Christmases? Yeah, yeah. Actually, a very good Christmas and New Year and everything. Yeah, so, nice. all refreshed, ready to come back. Yeah, we've got another set of episodes. And we're going to bring loads of guests, haven't we? Adam, do you want to give a little snippet of what's coming up this season? Yes, we've got guests. We've got all sorts of... We've got guests. We've got quizzes. We've got topics, Q&As, that sort of thing. All sorts of stuff ready for you. We've we've even got a specialist episode. We have. Coming up for you. Yeah. So we won't say much about that at the minute, but we have a very specialist episode coming up for you as well. Yeah, it's been really exciting and we can't wait to get stuck in. Obviously, Lucy is now joining us full time. So we have Lucy for the whole season and hopefully more. And yeah, so if we're all ready, let's, I think we should start the first episode with a topic. So now how it works, we'll change it up a little bit. Every week, each of us is going to bring a different topic, a quiz or a guest interview. So this week, it falls to Lucy to bring us our topic. So what have you got for us, Lucy? <laughs> So I'm kind of bringing you all back to school with this. So before I delve into the topic, what to you two defines musical theatre? That's a question. I mean, the obvious is music and theatre. Um, but... Yeah, sort of like a, a, a play. Well, you know a play with music, but like a show where there's music, dancing, um, possibly comedy, possibly not. Um, and big musical numbers. Because yeah. mm. to me, musical theatre, the musical itself, the music helps the plot along. It's my That's... opinion on it. So mm. it is sort of, you've got your dancing and your acting, but the music isn't just there in the background. It enhances the story. Mm-hmm. So what I'm going to delve in today is the evolution of musical theatre and how we got to what we call modern theatre today. Mm-hmm. So the earliest record of music being used in plays is traced back to the ancient Greece. And this was used in sort of worship of gods and things and was very prevalent, particularly in sort of the tragedies. And this was also then used throughout the centuries. And the first sort of defining point in musical theatre history was during the Renaissance in Italy, where they combined music and theatre and these are known as operas, or in Italian translates to works, so opera works. 
So this incorporated a number of performing arts, such as acting and scenery, but often dance, such as ballet. And this is what people define as the first sort of point in musical theatre's history, because they had all these really grand numbers. And they were in, understood to be entirely sung pieces. So, I mean, there's not many musicals that sort of spring to mind where they are entirely sung. I think Les Mis, I think, is probably a good example of one where... Les Mis, yeah. probably uh, a lot of Andrew Lloyd Webber's stuff mm. as well. So this was then spread throughout Europe and became very popular within the 18th century. And it was firmly established within sort of Western classical music. And Wolfgang was very prevalent at the time for opera and he was very renowned and he composed such comedic works such as Don Giovanni and the Magic Flute. Have I really too seen an opera though? Because considering it was very firmly established in sort of English, you know, musical heritage. I've never I've seen, seen an opera. One. No, I've never, never seen, seen an opera. I, I, oh, I'll be brutally honest. The only time I've only seen a snippet of an opera is probably New Year's Day when I was flicking through the TV to see what was on TV. And usually BBC Two has like um, an opera on it. And it's like, oh, it's an opera. I don't know what it is. I don't know what they're talking about. But yeah, it's an opera. Um, I've never seen one here, but I saw one in Budapest. And if anyone is li anyone listening, if you have seen an opera, whether it be here or anywhere else, please comment because I would be wait, interested to know. Wait, yeah. wait. Which opera did you see? Just out of curiosity, which opera did you see in Budapest? Oh, it was um, it was the assassin. I can't remember the name, but it was the assassination of the queen, and it was meant to be a tragedy, but. There were so many comedic pieces going on. Like I thought, you know, we're not going to understand the word, but we paid about eight pounds for tickets, but we had fantastic views. And I was like, well, eight pounds, we're getting a good show at the end of the day because it was a fantastic view. And it was so over the top. Like they had, they had the translations in sort of Hungarian, but also English. So all of the, old, pretty much the majority of the audience, if you could speak Hungarian or understand English, you knew what was going on with the plot. Right. And people would sort of, there'd be these amazing arias going on. And people would be standing in the background, just watching from the wings, enjoying this really romantic aria. This man got stabbed and then dragged off into the wings in the background. My German friend who I was watching with, she was like, do you know what's going on? She's like, why has that man been murdered? But they're carrying on singing. And I was like, the only thing I can think of is it's meant to re represent sort of like plots of foot. Because <laughs> 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 it was based on sort of like, this man comes back, his wife has been seduced by this other man because she's been drugged. They're having a reconciliation and this prince has popped someone off because he's like, right, I want her off the queen now and take the throne. And then at one point, this man starts singing and he's like raising his sword in the air. And the audience are just really slowly clapping along. And he did this for like a minute. And we thought, is this the end? Then he lowered his sword and carried on singing again. <laughs> we were just thinking, what is... and people were smashing things on stage. It was, it was so, it was brilliant. It was just so over the top. Is this the Budapest version of Rocky Horror Show? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think, like, for my first experience of opera, it was so OTT and it was just so, everyone was just putting their all. And at one point, the queen has died and this man goes, see here, the king is weeping. And then a light comes on, the king is there and he goes, weeping? I am not weeping. And we burst start laughing. And everyone else in the audience is just looking at us. And we were like, is this meant to be funny? Because this is hilarious. <laughs> see, to me, that, see, to me, that's musical theatre. Yeah. yeah. And I absolutely loved it. So if you haven't seen an opera, go see one. Well, I'll just... I was saying, I just remembered that I have seen some form of opera. Ooh. I've seen, well, I've been into two opera houses in uh, uh, Germany. Mm. I travelled around Germany a couple of years ago and I went to Leipzig Opera House, which is quite prolific, and Dresden Opera House, which is really mm. quite famous. And at uh, the Leipzig Opera House, we went on to, we were doing like a backstage tour and we were exploring it and we went on to the set and things. I think they had a 24 hour opera on. And you, hours. you saw it over 24 hours, you saw it in ships. Uh, I think that, yeah, and the cast sort of changed and changed, and it was 
weird. I, don't, I didn't see it, but I saw the set and we had talked a lot about it. And it was just one of those, one of those really modern, weird sets for you. Like, this, this is an opera. This is 24 hours long. What are they going to do? <laughs> I just didn't. It was really, really. Oh, it was one of the weirdest experiences. So, Lucy's seen an opera in Budapest. You've seen the set of an opera in Germany, a couple of sets in Germany. Yeah. I'm the one missing out. I've just seen BBC Two for about five minutes. That's all I've seen. Honestly, go and see one. It will not be what you're expecting. I want to see one. I want to see operas. I do want to go see them. I just worry that I wouldn't understand what's going on. But well, then again, a lot of people, a lot of people like that for musical theatre, aren't they? They're like, what's going on? What's going mm. on? Why are they singing? Why are they singing? I'm wondering if that's why they did that now. So maybe sort of for modern operas, they do have sort of a translation on so you can understand what's going on. But mm. the first sort of modern conception, moving away from opera, moving more into establishing musical theatre as it is today. The first modern conception was actually a play called The Black Crook. And this opened on the 12th of September in 1866 in New York City. And it was classed as the first musical which defined what we would see as a modern musical today because it incorporated dance, original composed music, and it incorporated it in a show to tell a story. And the reason why it came about though was because originally a theatre had burnt down and the ballet troupe were just left stranded in the city. So one enterprising producer went, well, we can't have these women running around in tights. So he essentially just put them on the stage and had them dancing to a backdrop of sort of, you know, it was a very sort of like fairy tale mythical plot. Well, it was essentially just a story, but the plot didn't really go anywhere. And then they added their own sort of scenery and songs to it. So that's the first sort of defining moment. So singing, dancing, but not really much plot to it. It was kind of singing and dancing for the sake of having singing and dancing. Sounds like Cats. <laughs> well, cats, cats to me is very sort of a dance musical. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what class it was sort of like a traditional musical. But by the 1920s in the US, they had developed it into more sort of like a vaudeville cabaret sort of style show. So they used jazz and beautiful dancing girls. Again, not much plot. At this point, musical theatre didn't really have a plot. It was all about big show-stopping numbers and dance. And one of the most notable people during this time was Florenz Ziegfeld. And he created a series, so it was Florenz Ziegfeld. Oh, Florenz Ziegfeld. Oh, I know him. So he released a series of theatrical reviews, and he called these the Ziegfeld Follies. And he was known as the glorifier of the American girl, because he basically thought, what is the point in theatre if you can't have beautiful women dancing? I mean... I get it because it would be appealing to the eye just seeing sort of like sparkling costumes and girls dancing but yeah. he actually helped in sort of moving along musical theatre so in 1927 he produced Showboat ah. not in his usual style but it did revolutionise musical theatre in America because it was the first musical to utilise songs as part of the storytelling Obviously, it's not done, Showboat isn't done much today because sort of the connotations haven't really aged very well with sort of modern yeah. society, but it was a defining point in musical theatre. Mm -hmm. And the lyrics were done by Jerome Kern, who was one of the first sort of composers to actually do book musicals. So he's really... Oh, mm. so turning books into, into shows. Hmm. Uh, and the lyrics were done by Hammerstein and Wodehouse mm -hmm. and musicals in this area, area tend to have really catchy songs and dynamic choreography but the characters also had very you know in-depth sort of plots and sort of character development which is what you didn't really see in sort of these theatre shows now, the start of the golden age of musical theatre in the 1940s, I think you can both sort of, you know, get who it is going to be. Rodgers and Hammerstein, yeah. Oklahoma. Yeah. 
So they, uh, they were, it was Rogers and Hammerstein wrote Oklahoma, and it was the first musical to solidify this new type of musical. And it was based on a play called Green Grow the Lilacs. Uh-huh. But every song, every dance had a reason for being there. I mean, for instance, the, you know, the dream ballet, that really yep. enhances sort of the plot of what Laurie's going through, all these conflicting emotions during that time. And it also a pioneered the original cast recording. Ah. I did not know that sort of Oklahoma was like the starting point of cast recording being a thing. Did I? I Wow. Wow. Mm. And so the golden age of what people define the golden age continued right up to the 1960s and included sort of musicals such as Guys and Dolls, Carousel, Gypsy, Sound of Music, so all these fantastic classics during this era. And within the 1960s, musicals began to incorporate more modern themes, so such as West Side Story. And this was with the arrival of rock and roll because people felt musicals, the classical sort of themes, didn't really fit with the here and now. They wanted more modern themes. So rock and roll was becoming to get more prevalent in musical theatre, whereas other, you know, concepts, more classical themes were a bit seen as a bit outdated and old fashioned. So in the UK, though, whilst this was going on in the US and Broadway, British playwrights were developing their own style. So the first such musical was Oliver, by Lionel Bart. Oh, Lionel Bart, yeah, good on Oliver. It went on to be an international success, and from there, it just sort of took off. So in the UK, they're sort of defined, the writers were developing sort of more rock and pop shows. So my favourite, Rocky Horror. You've got very, like, cult classes. So Richard O'Brien doing Rocky Horror, and you've also got Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber producing Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. And marked the dawn of the mega musicals within the UK, which mega musical, these were defined by having huge budgets and they were technologically advanced sets, lighting effects. These were massive. They, were, they went more beyond sort of just like the actors and music. They were incorporating sort of the set and all the visuals around it. And In the 1970s, though, in Broadway, Hair hit Broadway. And this was seen as the first musical to use entirely rock music. So they'd moved completely away from the classical sort of concept of musicals. And this is what people, this is what some people think defined the end of the golden age, because it was seen as so radical and controversial for its time. But this also paved the way for other rock musicals on Broadway and also helped expand those on the West End. Now, in the 1980s, Broadway wasn't performing that well in the West End. So Broadway shows that were coming over here weren't really doing very well. So Lloyd Webber developed Cats. Now, this was- Was was Cats meant to help or hinder? Help, actually. Uh, really? So, Cats, when it was developed, it was not only the first successful dance musical, but it was also the first show to produce merchandise for that show. Ah, uh, yes. So, the iconic, the iconic Cat's Eyes. And yeah, yeah, I get you. they really were the ones to start pushing sort of use of merchandise in shows on the West End. So... I think it's, which I think is phenomenal. Like you don't really think about these kind of things. And then I read that and I thought, I thought this would have been going a lot longer, but no. Ages. Mm. Ages and ages. So moving away from sort of Cats, in the 1990s on like Disney musicals were the big thing. So we got sort of Beauty and the Beast, Lion King, these were all being released on Broadway. And obviously yeah. now we're getting things like, you know, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, we're getting like much more sort of Disney, and even Frozen. I know that's Frozen. I know yeah. that's on Broadway, but I do know Frozen's been released out on Hercules Disney. is coming as well. Mm. So musicals nowadays are either written in classical styles or more modern. 
and modern incorporates sort of harp and rock. But these also incorporate jukebox musicals. Now I'm sure, and I, I know Ben, you're, you're not a big fan of jukebox musicals, are you? I'm not. They're I think, cheats. I, think I, like, I like the idea of jukebox musicals because, you know, you've already got sort of, you know, very popular songs that everyone's going to know it. And then you just happen to put it to a plot. So I think one of my favourite ones I've seen was actually All Shook Up. And I didn't realise I knew that many Elvis songs. And you just, you know, every one, every one is just a great hit. And you're just like, oh, yeah. Like, you can just sort of enjoy Bat Out of Hell as well. That was fantastic for a set. Now, that is a mega musical with a fantastic set. If anybody wants to see something where just there's so much effort and thought gone into the visuals and the effects and the setting, go see Bat Out of Hell because that is fantastic. But yeah, sort of things like Mamma Mia, these are all sort of all coming up. And these often incorporate these modern musicals, more stronger themes. So they focus on sort of things like homophobia, racism, just gen and sort of like poverty in the here and like rent that was focusing on sort of like people struggling to pay the rent and things. A lot of the classical musicals didn't really, they were all a lot more sort of nicer, sort of whimsical themes, whereas sort of now you're getting more nitty gritty kind of themes. And I think that's- Did you know, did you know Rent is based on an opera? Oh, I did not know that. Oh, this is a good on? point to converge on. Yeah. Um, rent is based on La Boheme. Um, so uh, a lot of the characters that you see in Rent are from an opera. Uh, and they're, the same, they're just uh, altered slightly differently um, to um, the, the plots to say. So obviously the, the majority of it is about people struggling with AIDS. Um, and... The, the crisis that was around in the 80s and 90s, mm. mainly in the 90s at the moment, and the base of the musical. But yeah, it's based on an opera. So, uh, La Vie Bohème, um, there's only one uh, There's only one piece of music that's actually from the opera that's played on a guitar in Rent. Um, and uh, it's it's like two seconds long. Um, oh, I did not know so that. So yeah. Yeah. So there you are, you see? So, oh, mate, uh, Lucy, that's, that was awesome. Nice little that's rundown brilliant. there of, of stuff. I, I, again, it's fascinating. You, you don't realise, again, there's all sorts of different types of productions. There's operettas, operas, musical theatre, dance musicals, mega musicals, jukebox mm. musicals. Wow. Wow, that's That was a nice brilliant idea. rundown. Oh, God, yeah. That's well, just like, a, back at school, history lesson. There we go. A-star. A A-star. A Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, so. I would give you a star star, uh, but uh, I can't, so. Well, I thought it was, I thought, thought it was fascinating, but. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for the topic, Lucy. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to the topic in a couple of weeks time for another one. So now it's time to go into my section, which this week is a nice and difficult quiz. I am looking forward to oh, this. Oh, now, wow. seeing as uh, Lucy just talked to us about history and musical theatre, I thought we'd talk about thespian terms. Oh. Okay. What's your mouth? Oh, thespian, right, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not sure how many questions are asked, we're just going to ask as many as we can. I'm going to give fine. you a term, and then I'm going to give you a multiple choice answer, and each of you is going to buzz in using your various sounds. So, Adam, your sound is... <laughs> Perfect. And Lucy, your sound is? Brilliant. Okay. Why have you got that, Lucy? <laughs> well, you just bag. randomly had that. It was in my goodie bag from work. I don't know why the only game was <laughs> part of the xylophone, but there you go. <laughs> it finally came in you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Brilliant. Oh, God. Right. Okay. Give a title and I'll give you a multiple choice. Um, three answers. Just buzz in and I'll try and follow you on that screen. Okay. So a fade, is that when a costume piece has been washed too many times, to slowly die, or a diminishment in lighting or sound level? Oh, Lucy. I'd say C. C. Mm. And you'd be correct. Yes. Okay, that's quite a, quite a nice easy one. Okay, the next one. <laughs> Downhill from here. Yeah, absolutely. Adam, you might need to make your sound a little bit louder, I think. 
Louder? Yeah. Okay, I'll try. It gets... It, there we go, perfect. So, <laughs> on to B. An electric light that is left turned on in an otherwise dark and unoccupied theatre. Is that called a stage light, a ghost light, or a safety light? Adam. It's a ghost light. Correct. Well done. Hey. Okay. Next one. Throw. Is that A, a poor performance? B, the distance between the project projector and the object being lit? Or C, when an object is tossed from the wings to the actors on the stage? Lucy. That's C. No, it's not. Is it? Is it? Uh, can I steal? Can I steal? Yeah, you can steal. Is it? Is it B? It is B. Well done. Yes. Well done. So that means I think now that Adam, you're on two, and Lucy is on one. Just keep dropping your scores, please, because I forget. Come on. Come on. I've got. I've got it. Don't worry. Brilliant. Next one. An experimental theatre space, typically unembellished, with black walls and a flat floor, is called A, a flat box, B, a free box, or C, a black box. Adam. Black box. Correct, C. of course. Hey. Where's my pen gone? Okay, next one. A god mic. Is that a nickname for the microphone used by the director during rehearsals? B, a prop like megaphone? Or C, a nickname for an actor who has an inflated ego? <laughs> oh, yeah, Lucy? I just said A, the directors. Correct. Well done. Oh, well done. I, I, oh. okay. I've used one of those, but I've never known it was called that. To be honest, good, I, I was thinking you were going to say like the stage managers. I was kind of waiting for like you to say sort of like the stage managers, mm. Mike. Or something. I thought it might be the one that you hang from the ceiling that picks up general sound. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Next. Ready for the next one? Yes. When an actor moves up stage centre, commanding attention, thus forcing his fellow actors to turn their backs towards the audience. Is that called centering, upstaging, or having it up? <laughs> Adam, I think. Is it upstaging? It is. Well done. <laughs> Lucy, if, no, you're, guess, if you're buzzing in, we can't hear your little dinger. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Hold your dinger closer to the mic. I, I don't even bloody know where the mic is on this thing. <laughs> wow, well, chaos. Okay. Next one, I don't know it. Well, I do know this, but I shouldn't know it because I never am. Off book. Is it A, when a director reads from the script? B, when an actor improvises? Or C, when an actor has memorised their lines? Lucy. C. Correct. Oh, the bane of my life, line learning. Hey, mate, don't worry about it. We're all like, we all have the same problem. I'm not off book until probably... I've been off book. I've been on book in dress rehearsals. I've been having. I thought having a script in, in bits that of set, was, and sort of pulls it out at the very last terrify minute. Terrify me! Would terrify me. Yeah. Like, every time, every time I've been proper way through shows, it's been fine. <laughs> <laughs> Next one: a type of stage surrounded by the audience on three sides. Is that a thrust stage, a push stage, or a try stage? <laughs> Adam, thrust stage. Collect. <laughs> Done. R dot C or R C is an abbreviation okay. for A Renaissance Court, B Rehearsal Center, or C Right Center. Lucy. Right Center. Correct. Well done. Well done. Made more sense to be a direction rather than a thing. Mm. Yeah. Next one. A remark to express a character's thoughts to the audience while still in the presence of the other characters who are not supposed to overhear. Is that an SB, this says? Is that, if I say that correctly? An aside or a mention? <coughs> Lucy was first. Is that an aside? It is. Well done. Oh, have you got five now, Lucy? We've both got five. We're tired. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How many more questions There's are there? There's seven. 
Oh, okay. So, oh, is it still all playthrough, right? Power theories. A scrim is that a broad stage lighting device, a pit beneath the stage, or a gauze light material used as a drop. Adam. Is it A? No. <gasps> Lucy, you can steal. Is it um, B? A pit beneath a stage? Hmm. Nope. Oh, no. it's, a, it's a gauze like material used as a drop. Uh, yeah. it's, that, it's that two sided stuff. Oh, that stuff. Oh, okay. Oh, that's a so scrim. Okay, gotcha. Right. Next, a scene or speech following the end of the main action of the play. Is that an encore, an epilogue, or a prologue? Bang. Adam. Epilogue. Correct. Oh, you were very close on that one, but I heard Adam's sound, whatever it is. <laughs> Squeaker! Before... <laughs> Squeaker, sorry. Before Lucy thing. <laughs> right. So an arena stage is at a place below the main stage where audience members throw fruit and vegetables at the actors performing. Is it a central stage surrounded by the audiences on all sides? Is it a stage during a production where the actors learn their stage combat choreography? Lucy. Me. B is correct. Well done. Uh, I knew so that whenever... I wanted to ding in on B and I was like, no, I'm just going to wait for the last one. <laughs> the role of a sweet and often naive woman is called ingenue, greenhorn or heel. Lucy. Ingenue. As soon as you said ingenue, I knew what you were going to be on about. Correct. Oh. Hotspot. Is that the moment on stage when an actor drops his or her lines? Is it B, an area on stage that is brightly lit? Or C, the point in the story where the characters run into obstacles? Lucy. C? Incorrect. Oh. As in, it, B? So it is B, oh. an area on stage that is brightly lit. See, I was thinking, is it that? And I was like, no, I'm going to go with C. Right, so we've got two more left. What are the scores oh. looking like? We're even. Even. We, yes, even. we didn't get the scrim one. <laughs> Ooh, okay. So the next one is a fireproof curtain that can be dropped to separate the audience from a stage in the event of a fire. Is that A, proofing curtain, B, orange curtain, or C, the safety curtain? Oh, I think Lucy was first. Sorry, Adam. Safety curtain. It is, of course, a safety curtain. Right, last one. Adam, you need, you need this to draw. I and Lucy, I need that, yeah. you just need to extend your lead. Okay. Hey, Lucy, I think I can hear the door. You need to go and answer the door. <laughs> Stop using diversionary tactics, Adam. Come on. You're better than that. Right. I am. A raked stage. Is that A, a stage in need of repainting and possibly rebuilding? B, a stage that is raked to move up or down however, however production needs to dictate. Or C, a sloping stage that is raised at the back or upstage end. <laughs> oh, God, you were equal on the screen. <laughs> oh, no. Right. Adam. C. Correct, of course. Oh, hey. So, on that... There's a tie break, and I don't know what to ask you. Ooh. Uh, I will, I'm going to have a... I'm going to have a... <laughs> I fight mean... To the death? Yeah, fight to the death, yeah. Well, joke's on you, Adam. I'm a black belt, so bring it. Oh, uh, in which case... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Adam, I'll be very that careful right fired. now. <laughs> right. <I'm> always lonely. <laughs> so, seeing as we're talking a lot about cats today we're going to have a sudden death round of completing the cats musical line how about that? right how about for you, you just give us the thing with the yeah. blank and the first one to answer correctly wins oh well i never was there ever a cat so blank as magical mr ding 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 well at least he shouted that out and Adam ah. dinged. this is not going well Give it to Lucy. She got it anyway. Yeah, you she sure? Got it. That was what I was going to say. Oh, yeah, 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 right, Lucy. After <laughs> yeah. all well of that, done, Lucy. you have won. Well done. Woo well done, Lucy. Well, that, done. I, well done, guys. Well done. That was a nice that quiz, was, Ben. That was, that was cool. brilliant. Wow. 
So it's now time to move on to our very last section, which this week, Adam, you are chatting to a guest. I am indeed. Do you want to introduce your interview? I am going to be chatting to Lucy Cadney. Ooh. And you'll be hearing more about speaking to Lucy as we speak in a few minutes. So have a listen to her, what we talked about. So we're going to welcome Lucy Cadney, who is a freelance speech and drama practitioner. Hello, Lucy. Hello. How are you? How are you? Oh, I'm all right, thank you. I'm I know, sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, uh, thank you ever so much for coming to have a chat with me about um, your life, really. Yeah. And I wanted to start off by saying, how did it all start, Lucy? Where did you get this book from? Um, well, my mum says it all started when I went to ballet lessons. I think probably like three, something like that. And uh, my, my ballet teacher said, uh, well, she used to do drama, which take that as you will. Um, <laughs> um, so I started a drama class um, and then yeah, that was where I was really, really tiny. Um, and we moved around a lot actually. Um, my folks were in the army. Right, so okay. we kind of, uh, I was in Shrewsbury, I lived in London, moved to Germany, um, and then eventually settled in Derby when I was about seven, six or seven. Um, and then came to Derby and I joined um, this little place called Centre Stage. Um, and basically, I've just not left. Excellent. So and for I'm those that don't know. Those that don't know, what is Centre Stage for a lot of people? Because so, we get a lot of listeners, but a lot of them don't know a lot of local places. So tell us a little bit about Sure, sure, sure. Um, so Centre Stage Theatre Arts um, is a young people's theatre school um, based in Derby. We've got two locations, um, formerly known as Centre Stage Theatre School, but it's now Centre Stage Theatre Arts. So we, um, we, we meet weekly in two locations and we have... Um, performing arts classes, looking at generally drama, um, singing and dance, but we also kind of put those skills towards bigger projects. So like your Amdram groups, we pr um, produce youth theatre. So I kind of see us as a, a bit of a, a bridge the gap between a performing arts school and um, a, a youth theatre kind of thing. And what got you, how long ago was it you started with Centre Stage? <laughs> Well, Centre Stage started in 1995, and I joined in 1997. Wow, so, okay. a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as you've already mentioned, you know, it's a wonderful connection for, for kids and, and things. And you do shows as well. And what's been some of your standout shows that you've enjoyed doing? Oh, goodness. Well... In terms of shows, we kind of, I kind of have a three-part relationship with Centre Stage. I've got my me as a student, I've got me as a teacher, and now as um, as the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so, as principal, I've done um, my first show was Legally Blonde. Uh, crikey, hit the ground running with two live animals and a whole host of teenagers um in fact little tidbit um lucy gazard's dogs were our dogs in legally blonde oh fab um, okay and then we dogs. <laughs> Brilliant. yeah fab fab dogs um and they stole the show obviously so of that course. that's a standout for me as well yeah um what else did i love i loved my last show as a performer we did oliver back in 2009 um and I played Widow Corny, which was great. Oh, wow, yeah, good part. Yeah, fab, fab role. Um, a little bit jealous because my sister was Nancy, mm, you know. Yeah. But no, Widow Corny was a fantastic role. Um, I think just as a teenage girl, everyone's like, I want to be Nancy. And actually, <laughs> Widow Corny was great. It was really, really good. Yeah, it's a good um, comical part as well, isn't it? Oh yeah, and I got to do it with one of my best friends. Um, he was he was Mr. Bumble, so that that was great fun, really, really great fun. Brilliant. And you say you're the boss now. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. I mean, so... it's, it's amazing, you know, fantastic, well done. Um, <laughs> what made you want to take on that role? What made you want to do that? 
Well, um, uh, good friend James Rayner, or James Bowden now, um, James ran Centre Stage from, oh golly, sort of 2006. Um, so James ran it for about 10 years and I've known James first as my teacher and then later um, as the principal of Centre Stage and I taught drama there. Um, and James, um, James's life was take his career was taking him in a different direction. Um, and probably not out the blue to him, but to me, completely out the blue, um, he approached me and said, how would you feel about, um, you know, taking over from me? And um, wow, that was, <laughs> I was not <laughs> expecting that. Um, because I guess it had always been a bit of, I know it's so, it's so cheesy to say this, but it had always been a bit of a pipe dream to kind mm -hmm. of, you know, run my own place and get to be, you know, the person in charge of all the creative decisions, all the boring decisions as well, you know, all the finance and safeguarding and all that very important, but less than creative stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and sort of thought about it and I chatted to my husband because we'd only been married a couple of months at this point I was like All right, it's going to be evening work a lot of the time yeah. lots of weekends and, and he's a teacher so you know not exactly you know um so we ch chatted about it and we just said he just said kind of go for it and uh it's been a whirlwind um James was amazing with the handover he wrote me this um book a bible if you like <laughs> how to do this and um you know, was there to kind of help me with the transition. Um, and all the parents and the students were phenomenal. Most of them I already knew because I'd I'd taken about a year's gap from teaching there. Um, but most of them I, I, I still knew. Um, and yeah, just, just very much flying by the seat of my pants, but learning as a go, um, improvising, if you like. Um, yeah, it's... It's, it's just so bizarre. I mean, it makes such a lovely story that I joined age six and am now, personally, and uh, running it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can tell you're very passionate about it, which is, yeah. which is great. And we've worked together and ever since I've known yeah. you, have always been really passionate about it. And what is it that you find, do you find bits of yourself in some of the kids as well that you see mm. that you teach? And what do you see in them? Um, perfectionism. <laughs> um, Self-doubt. Um, anxiety. But above all, like just a love for performing and being yeah. there. Um, you know, the, the thing I love about, or I call, always call my kids, which they probably hate because they're all, a lot of them are teenagers, but they are so real and I genuinely absolutely love being around them um they're such an accepting bunch they are a completely um eclectic bunch um, um unlike some youth theatres nobody because we're, we're sort of this hybrid that I talked about um they that nobody's auditioned to come in we do audition for the shows but nobody auditions to join us um, and that's amazing because we we see people who come with no confidence and grow to be these absolutely astonishing performers and you just wouldn't expect and um that's really lovely and we've had some students who have joined when they were well we've had a couple that have not long left who were with us for over 10 years um kind of like myself I guess um and I mean that that just says so much about you as a person I think if you can stick at something voluntarily for a decade of your life it's just amazing so yeah. yeah I really admire them in a lot of ways wonderful oh that's brilliant news and uh, from the past as well and I'm sure the present there have been a lot of centre stage students who have gone on to make you professionally as well in the, in the yeah. industry um is that still the case do a lot of them come back to teach or um so we had when we did our Wizard of Oz uh, was my well Wizard of Oz took place in 2018. I know because it was approximately seven and a half weeks after I had my little boy. <laughs> of course, as you do. As you do, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Not going to feel a lot of punishment, it's fine. <laughs> so we, we did that. That was, that was an absolute whirlwind. It was amazing. Um, 
but that was our first production at Derby Theatre as well. So that was wow. just insane. Like I, you know, I had I had Robin in um, like a little baby bouncer in the changing rooms, and um, I sort of keep whipping him off to feed him. And then um, and then my mum was kind of doing some costumes, but also looking after the baby <laughs> because I was breastfeeding at the time, so I couldn't be apart from him. And yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so sorry, back to what we're actually talking about. Um, so Sarah Middleton and Andy Coxon came to lead a fantastic workshop for us, um, working with the kids, um, because both Sarah and Andy were in our, produ- uh, well, I say our, our original production of The Wizard of Oz, which took place in 2005, I want to say. Wow. Um, I had an amazing role. I was a tree. Excellent. Epic. Not the first time in my career that I've played a tree either, but there we are. Um, and yeah, they came and led this this fantastic workshop, um, and the kids the kids loved that. Really, really loved it. And I think it was so special to not just have a professional come and speak to them, but just someone who had been through what they were going through. And yeah. um, you know, it hadn't hadn't necessarily always got the lead roles, or had had disappointing auditions and just have those real connections those real stories um yeah that was that was great we've had other workshops along the way um i mean back in the day in fact twice we've had um peter polycarpu come and wow. lead a workshop um so both times that uh, center stage performed Les Mis, the first time i was in it second time i was on the production team when my sister was in it um the, yeah, Peter Polycarpi came to lead these workshops and oh wow, he was just phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Um, I'm sure my mum still thinks that he is her friend. Um, I think she took <laughs> as much from the workshops as we did, but um, there we are. And then most recently, the workshop we had was with um, Mischief Theatre Company. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Who do the play that goes wrong, comedy about bank robbery, etc. They were fantastic it was so good I think the kids were quite nervous um because it was it was a sort of a straight acting kind of thing it it was it was improv based a lot of it and sort of comedy and it was wonderful absolutely fantastic I had an absolute blast just watching great oh that's wonderful and you we mentioned at the start that you you're a freelance speech and drama teacher and you've mentioned yes. a lot about your center stage how have you found have you been doing other work during the we've got to mention the lockdown, we've got to mention yeah. lockdown. yeah yeah of you course managed to keep busy so i mean center stage is like my my real passion it's it's my life basically it's yeah i don't don't, don't do percentages but it's it's a vast amount of my life um but in terms of my my weekly work, I work sort of four and a half days a week um, teaching in schools um, as a speech and drama teacher, um, teaching one to one lessons. Um, and I've also got a few private students as well. So I probably teach about, I don't know, 55 one to one lessons a week, um, coaching the Lambda syllabus. Um, audition uh prep for drama school i've got a student currently um auditioning uh well self-taping for drama school and i I lead um lead the drama the drama club at a local school where we put on school productions and things um i'll I'll do do a bit of everything really but um yeah it's the one-to-one stuff and again absolutely brilliant absolutely shattering at times so today um today i started work at at nine and i've pretty much been on zoom all day so about half past five doing one-to-one um half my students didn't even turn their cameras on today so trying to coach one-to-one drama where i can literally just hear this little crackly voice and yeah (laughs) i love it but um I can't wait to be back in person. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Like technology is great. It's, it's yeah. provided us with so many opportunities that we just would not have had in this situation 15 years ago. Um, even like five years ago, to be honest. Um, but I am just craving like the in-person contact with, with my students and obviously with my friends and family and stuff, but you know, drama and performance, it's just such a, person human behavior based thing and you just don't get that from an ipad no 
no you don't no, it's so true so true you, you mentioned about you know the one-to-one contacts and, and everything else as let, let imagine that there's quite a few listeners out there who are interested in either solely going to teach or have acted before and then decide to want to teach what advice would you give them if they wanted to do the similar sort of thing to you Um, well, I don't know if I'll ever escape being self-employed now because it's kind of one of those, as frustrating as it is, um, I also love kind of the flexibility that comes with it. Um, it'd be, I, I, um, I fell into sort of doing a bit of coaching while I was at university and then kind of grew that a little bit more, um, picked up bits of work and then sort of, I graduated and I thought, oh, do you know what? I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do a bit more of this. And before I knew it, I had like full, a full week's worth of, of work. And um, my husband went into teaching and yeah, I just kind of fell into it. Um, I don't know that I would be where I am now if I'd sort of set out to do that, if you know what I mean. Yep. Um, but if you've got the passion for it, um, I would say keep learning, keep your eyes open um I mean I think the fact that I'm quite I mentioned anxiety in the pupils I'm I'm a stressor basically and I, I really relate when I see the kids panicking about this that and the other you know really trivial things that I think gosh I wish I wish I could be panicking about that now <laughs> um, but um yeah I, I'm, I'm a worrier and so I, I look at I look at what I know and I'm like oh I don't know enough so I'm always like reading always watching plays and just kind of chatting and growing the knowledge. So I'd say that's that's a really important thing to do. Um, if you want to be a, a school teacher, it, it's university. Um, but uh, I guess, yeah, I didn't, I didn't follow a route in as such. I guess just keep your eyes open, keep the passion real and keep keep learning. Is that yeah. is that really easy to say? No, um, no, no, not at all, <laughs> no. Is it, would you say grab any opportunity as it comes? Massively, absolutely. Like, yeah, I, I, I had to take some really scary decisions yeah. um, to, to get where I am, and they were never. I've never followed the route I thought I was going to follow. Um, but yeah, I think being being open to that and just kind of trusting your gut a little bit, and um, I don't know, net, networking. Get, just have your network open just knowing people and talking to people that you know our current drama teacher at center stage wonderful wonderful woman um i met her by complete happenstance um at derby theatre we were at the departure lounge and um i was sat there on my own being being a stress head like looking at my notebook not talking to anyone and i heard i heard this voice going oh yeah i could just do with one more youth theatre and i just that week um discussed with our previous drama teacher that that they were moving on and I had this conversation I was like right you need to put your big girl pants on and talk to her so I turned around and I said sorry did you just say you'd like you'd like you're looking for some more work you, you you're a practitioner you work with kids fantastic do you mind if we um we get a coffee and um sort of go from there and and of course you go through all the kind of the the, the proper recruitment well she's freelance but you know all these safeguarding and all that sort of thing but actually you do just need to kind of be open. And I think people in people in drama and performing arts and things, they are the kind of people where that is really their life. Even if you are an accountant or you work for um, the NHS or something, you're always a drama person at heart. And I guess, yeah, there's, there's that everywhere I kind of go. <laughs> I'm full of cliches. I'm sorry. It's so. No, it's fine. No, no, it's good. It's all right. No worries. We can't be. Can't be a good cliche. Um, <laughs> just before you go, Lucy, tell me honestly, what's your favourite kind of drama to teach? Musical theatre. Yeah. I yeah. I, I say teach like oh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I love I love a bit of cheese. I do. Who doesn't? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Lucy, thank you ever so much for taking the time out to talk to me. No and, problem. Uh, and please, will you come back again? Yeah, of course. Uh, Absolutely. I, I love this. And put you off. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. no love Excellent. It. Love it. Well, thank you ever so much for your time. And I shall speak to you soon. See you soon, Adam. Bye. Bye.
So thank you, Lucy, ever so much for talking to me about everything that's going on. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon. That was great, Adam. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, okay, we have reached the end of episode one. We made it through. We survived. Well done. <sighs> well done, well everybody. Well done, guys. Adam, it's time for you to... You know what to do. Off you go. Oh, I've got it. So okay. can, we're we're carrying it on. Off you go. Bye, Adam. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Adam. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. See wow. you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs> the, the virtual background did not like that. Right. Um, it's all it remains to say is follow us on our social medias. We've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can find us on all of them at Encore Offstage Pod. If you enjoyed the show and you're listening on Spotify or um, any of our um, services and you'd like to leave us a rating or review, that would be great. If you're watching us on YouTube, hello, you can see us for once. And we'd love it if you would subscribe as well. Uh, if you're actually supporting us in a in a different way, you can support us over on Patreon. Uh, that is now launched. You can find the link to that in the description. Thank you all so much for watching. And from myself, Lucy, and Adam, we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.